Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, he covers stories that others have called unspeakable, unthinkable, and unimaginable. But for Philip Gurevich, those are exactly the stories that matter. A conversation with this best-selling author next on Dialogue. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. A welcome as well to those of you listening on public radio and the World Wide Web. Not many people would want to go to a country after a massacre and try to find out what happened. But for New Yorker staff writer Philip Gurevich, ignoring such stories makes him more uncomfortable. His book about the 1994 Rwandan genocide, called We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families, was the recipient of numerous honors. Gorevich, who's also the editor of the Paris Review, turned his sights recently to understanding the events at Abu Ghraib prison, where American soldiers were accused of abusing and torturing inmates. The book has recently been republished as the Ballad of Abu Ghraib. I was able to speak with Gorevich at the Sun Valley Writers Conference. Since 1995, the conference has been bringing together authors to talk about the nexus between literature, history, and current events. I started by asking Gorevich to explain more about what draws him to the stories he covers. You've said you're really interested in stories that perplex you or even make you turn your head away. Why is that? Well, what draws me to them is that I'm, I don't understand the subject uh, fully, or there's something about it that eats at me and eats at my conscience and consciousness both. Um, and so whether it's uh, writing about Rwanda, whether it's writing about Abu Ghraib, whether it's writing about the way a murder can go unsolved for 30 years and then be come back to, or about uh, political crises, actually including uh, writing about the 2004 presidential election, uh, which I covered for The New Yorker. Um, what I often am drawn to is something where I, I don't know quite what I think. I know that I'm absorbed. I feel that it's the story, it may not yet be a story, the situation, uh, the, the, the problem is huge and contains many, many other smaller issues or smaller large issues, I should say, of our times. Uh, in, in Rwanda, uh, here you had the question of genocide, which we'd had all this never again rhetoric about after World War II, of refugees and what was, pe was being done to protect refugees, of an international community so-called and the Western powers that basically pledged to prevent certain kinds of violence and sent UN peacekeeping forces into uh, parts of the world where they then failed completely to prevent these things and what those false promises of protections, which we'd also seen in the Balkans and so on, uh, meant. Uh, it was all of these different things. And yet, when I went there, I didn't know what I was looking at. And, and at that point, I remember I said to an editor at The New Yorker, which is I went for the first time on a magazine assignment, um, we were talking about, well, why do you want to go? And I said at one point, in the midst of 50 other things, uh, you know, I don't think any of us really know how to think about Rwanda. And he said, that's your assignment. Go try and tell us how to think about Rwanda. I don't know if I would claim that I've done that, but I, I certainly look for pieces that will remain endlessly provoking to me, that when I dig into them, there's, in a sense, no bottom. I can go deeper and deeper, and that often my own view of them uh, it comes out to be much different from what I anticipated. That's much more interesting to me. I don't want to go with my mind made up and just confirm that I was right. Um, I often felt that, for instance, in the stories that I'm often most drawn to, uh, that they're, they're stories that are often described in, in kind of parentheses in the press as unspeakable, unthinkable, unimaginable. And when I hear those words, I think, wait a minute, isn't that our job as writers, as reporters, to do exactly those things, preferably in the order of you know, imagining, thinking, and speaking? Um, but that's what we're here to do. And so if, if, if what we're telling people is, oh, it's unimaginable, of course, what we're trying to say is it's huge and horrendous in scope. But what you're really telling a, an audience is, don't think about it. It's beyond you. You're letting everybody off the hook. And so I, I think evil is a word like that, too. Um, it suggests that some, some force external to individuals is at play. And what I'm often interested in looking at is, is how situations actually are created by people, both for the good and the bad. We often look, we look to people for the solutions, but we often ask, act as if the harm is abstract. 
let's talk about one of those situations that you have put in your book, The Ballad of Abu Ghraib. Um, the soldiers, the MPs in this book, are they villains or are they victims? Or a little bit of both? Well, I would say that if, if those are the choices, it's certainly uh, a little bit of both. Um, and uh, a lot, I would, I, would, I would not necessarily use only simply the word victim, which is too neat because it gets everybody off the hook and uh, so forth. Instrument. But I would say that what you really had in Abu Ghraib was that the MPs, the, the low-level American soldiers, and, and my book really focuses on the story, almost like a classical war story, like All Quiet on the Western Front or, or a Hemingway story, where you have a small group of young men and women in this case who are sent from a particular region, in this case Appalachian, Western Pennsylvania and West Virginia, into war, thinking they're going to serve their country, feeling patriotic after September 11th, uh, thinking that they'll get a leg up on some educational funding and so forth, an opportunity to get out of limited circumstances in their background, have an adventure, whatever their motive is. But basically, we're going to Iraq to do the good thing, liberate these people from a tyranny and so forth. And then they arrive at this prison, and it turns out that they're suddenly put in the position of essentially being torturers in Saddam Hussein's old dungeons. And they are doing that without fully knowing the letter of the law according to a policy that's been put in place in Washington. And when you demonstrate that, everybody who's looked at this as a reporter before I came along and was working with these transcripts from the filmmaker Errol Morris, I felt like they were all looking up the chain of command to pin it to the top. And I felt that was basically clear by then. And I also felt to really feel what happened and how in a sense we're all implicated. You have to see that it was at the bottom what happens with those soldiers. They're the ones who, I wouldn't say were simply villains or victims, but were, had been instrumentalized. They'd been weaponized, to use the Iraq war term, and turned into instruments of a policy, agents of a policy. And soldiers are there to follow orders and to do what they're told to do. And what a lot of those pictures were taken by soldiers who were kind of amazed, as they put it, at what was allowed. And we took those pictures focused rather narrowly on the people in them rather than the circumstances that they reflected. So what I would describe them as is instruments of a great injustice and victims slash the, ultimately the scapegoats of a great injustice. The fact that they are the only ones who have been held to account for this policy seems to me in some way as un-American in a sort of Frank Capra movie sense of what's right as the policies that they were over there implementing in the first place. But you, I believe you've also written you don't think it makes much sense to go through the whole process of holding, say, uh, former President Bush or Cheney or Rumsfeld accountable. What I've said is that I'm skeptical of the value of trying to prosecute uh, at every level below the top. That I don't think that politically, realistically, we're going to see the highest level uh, held accountable. And they're probably fairly well insulated, at least in legal uh, fog from easy prosecution. And I, I happen to be basically broadly sympathetic with President Obama's position that it would consume the country in a backwards looking way. That the first priority is to make sure that the country corrects these policies, recriminalizes torture, something that he did in the very first days of his administration, uh, tries to close down and sets about closing down the prisons where this is happening. So I'm much more worried about what might, for instance, be happening now at Bagram Air Base, which for a long time has been clearly a sort of next Abu Ghraib or the place where a lot of things that we think we're moving away from may still be going on, than I am with, with the idea that we might prosecute a president. Because I think that uh, if we do that, I'm not against it. I simply think it's politically unlikely for some pretty good reasons, and you don't want to get into a situation where every president's every decision is criminalized. And if you don't go for the top, how do you go for the guys in the middle? I just don't know that that's where the energy should be spent. We ended up knowing about these situations because of the photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, there were uh, not photos taken of some of the more even egregious acts that were going on there. Uh, but you do not put the photographs in your book. The Ballad of Abu Ghraib. They are in the uh, companion documentary, Standard Operating Procedure, by Errol Morris, who you, who you mentioned. And that was conscious, to leave the photos out, yes? Yeah. 
Well, um, you know, there's this notion out there that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I, as a writer, beg to disagree in some cases. I think uh, pictures have an emotional and newsmaking power, obviously. Uh, had there only been reports from Abu Ghraib, uh, it would have been a lot easier, in a sense, uh, to uh, suppress the story or scramble the story or keep people from getting shocked by the story. The pictures delivered the shock. They created a window. But we thought by looking at the pictures that we knew what we were seeing. And I don't believe that in the end that proved to be the case. What we thought we were seeing was Charles Grainer and Lindy England and Megan Ampule and uh, a bunch of others uh, doing terrible things on the night shift. And it was very easy then for the people who had ordered these policies in the administration to paint them as bad apples, to paint them as rogues, to paint them as depraved and perverted people, and to make the taking of the pictures into evidence of that depravity. What kind of sicko would do this? And we all kind of went along with this idea, yeah, you've got to be incredibly stupid to be so self-incriminating. Instead of saying, wait a minute, let's just imagine for a split second that they're not incredibly stupid, and therefore that they didn't think this was self-incriminating, that they thought it was something else. Either that, either that they were just showing, as soldiers often do when they tell the most shocking thing about their experience when they tell a war story, that they were merely showing what was happening, or that they were showing things that they didn't understand, uh, or that they actually thought that by taking pictures and showing that this was stuff that, that was going on and that they'd showed around at the prison, they would in a sense have an alibi, that it would actually be the opposite of self-incriminating. It would be self-exculpating. So to not put the pictures in, you're basically saying, hey, let's not make the pictures the whole story. Let's think about what the big picture, so to speak, is. It well, would not I, focus so much on looking at the little pictures. The pictures are also repellent, and I don't want my book to be repellent. I want my book to be saying to you, here's a subject that you probably have to some extent decided you know enough about, that you've seen the pictures, you've been grossed out, you've thought about it, you either uh, think it's just awful and everybody should go to jail, or you think, War's tough, and they blew up our buildings, which is more or less what the soldiers at Abu Ghraib were told and believed. But you don't feel the need to have to think this thing through again. And I'm saying, listen to these soldiers, because the book is largely told in the voices of these soldiers describing their experience and from their point of view at the bottom of this thing. And the photographs are available. So I didn't have to make the decision, should the public see these photographs or not. They were out there. They are out there. I wasn't holding them back from you. You can get them in a second. I was saying, let's listen to the story, let's hear the context, let's think about this, and let's in a sense have a second look, but not by looking at the pictures, by looking at the much broader context, because m a very great deal of what's outrageous about Abu Ghraib is not on film. And you don't know that. You don't know that it's illegal under American military doctrine to set up a prison in a combat zone, that we were rounding up thousands of people, not just the several score that were on that, that one cell block, thousands and thousands of people who were being held without any charges in these pens, that this was the context in which these soldiers were operating, and that their fears, their anxieties, the chain of commands, deceptions and falsehoods, all of these different things going on, and the photographs, in a sense, uh, it's like throwing a grenade into your consciousness, uh, it, and on the one hand it wakes you up very abruptly, but it also obliterates your ability to kind of reflect. You mentioned um, Lindy and Megan. Uh, I know one of the things I found interesting about this story was it seemed to me one of the first times we'd seen women, not just the MPs you mentioned, but also Captain Carolyn Wood, uh, General Janice Karpinski, women involved in a situation that included torture. Yeah, General Barbara Fast, who was the head of military intelligence uh, in the command at Central uh, Headquarters in Iraq, um, under General Sanchez. There were women, there were women at every a aspect of our military at this point, pretty much. And, um, but some had thought maybe when they got into the military they might take a lighter touch. That's not realistic. Mm -hmm. The Greeks got this right. Women in war, women, uh, like men in war, they do warrior things and if brutality's in order, they're brutal. Um, I do not think anybody who, I don't think anybody in the military thought that by putting women into the military they would make the kinder, gentler, softer touch military. What lesson should we take away, those of us who are not, we're not there, the average citizen from the Ballad of Abu Ghraib? Well, there are a couple of things, I suppose. One of the important things to me uh, that the book is really about is um, we like to think, I think, that individually and as a nation, uh, we're, in a sense, we don't do that. 
The president found it very effective just as a communication tool to dispel this crisis uh, scandal when it occurred uh, to say, we do not torture. And even as one looked at the evidence of things that sure looked an awful lot like torture and would be called torture if they were being done to us by our enemies somewhere in the world. Um, and we're not, nobody's immune to this. That the way that this is constructed is through pol policies. This is not the action of rogue individuals. These are choices the nation makes. And uh, they're hard to correct and they're important to correct. But I also think that one of the things is they can be corrected. Uh, one of the things that you see in this book is that it's done by sets of individuals in groups making policy, making decisions, implementing that policy, uh, and carrying it out at every level of the chain of command. And I think, uh, what, what one of, I suppose one of the uncomfortable lessons is uh, that this was done in our name and in, in the name of our security. This isn't the act of in rogue individuals. And left, right, and center in this country politically, nobody liked the Abu Ghraib story. Uh, nobody wanted to defend these MPs. Nobody really wanted to extend any sympathy to them as scapegoats because that implicates us all. Another incredible tragedy that you have looked at is Rwanda. You're still revisiting it and you believe that that is another situation that Im implicates us all, whether we were there or not, by the fact that we looked away. You know, what happened in Rwanda in, in 1994 is that there was a, a genocide committed uh, where the government of Rwanda, um, sp speaking in the name of a, the Hutu majority group, uh, roughly 85 percent of the population, implemented a policy of pro, uh, massacres uh, by which in the course of a hundred days uh, over, uh, some 800,000 people, many people now say a million, uh, were put to death, but not by killing squads of professional goons or by military police only, let's say, but by uh, ordinary citizens mobilized to kill their neighbors and their schoolmates and their parishioners and so forth. And a crime of this magnitude is always described as a crime against humanity. And so it does implicate us all unless we reject that concept. A crime against humanity means you and me, too. Um, and most of us don't feel that way. It's a very abstract notion. We feel that way when we sit down and think about it. But we don't feel that way when we read the newspaper. You sort of think, gee, things are messed up in China. You don't think that's happened and that's a, something that's blight on us all. But when it happens like this, I sometimes think of it almost as a crime against creation, an attempt to eliminate an entire category of humanity, a whole element of what's in the mix. And, and I think, uh, you know, when we talk about Rwanda, what happened there and the story there as far as it reflects upon us is that it was really a story about the failure of the world to intervene. And in that sense, it's in, in some ways, it, it stirs up many of the same kinds of concerns and passions as Abu Ghraib. Um, but at Abu Ghraib, it's the story of what happens when you intervene uh, with the idea that you can do everything. And in Rwanda, it's the story of what happens when, in a sense, having promised that we can do everything, we simply step back and do nothing. You really were one of the first people to strongly point out that the UN was not only ineffective, but as you say, putting forth uh, lies, false promises. And that was not a politically correct thing to point out at the time, but has, but has been corroborated. Do you think that, and, and many people may have seen Hotel Rwanda and have seen this story visualized with the uh, impotence of the United Nations, do you think things have changed or are they, is the UN still um, an ineffective agent? Oh, I think it's a very ineffective agent. I think that Rwanda is a place where the UN in many ways uh, came into a, a crisis that it has never come out of. Um, in, in Rwanda, you had a UN peacekeeping force. Much of the debate after the fact has been about, in Rwanda, should we or shouldn't we have intervened and done something? But of course, we had intervened, even though we don't always identify with the UN. The world community had sent the UN in with a peacekeeping force uh, in the fall of 1993 to help implement a peace deal. And then this genocide began, and we, led largely by the Clinton administration, uh, withdrew. And uh, the UN force that was left behind was incapable of doing anything, really, but standing around and watching the slaughter. Um, and it was disgraceful. And, you know, some people think that when I say all this, that means that I'm a gung-ho interventionist and I think we should go around fixing the world's problems. And I actually don't, um, in large part 
because I've never seen it done right. Uh, and I, it's one of the reasons I was a skeptic from the beginning about Iraq. I thought whatever the merits of the argument are on either side, I just can't see us pulling this off correctly. It's not something we do is to make other people's political and historical destinies work better by throwing the army at them. But what, I, what really bothered me in Rwanda was this false promise of protection. When you send the UN in, when you say, here we are, when you start urging people to gather, and this happened in Rwanda, people were told, come to this UN base for protection, people who were being hunted in the streets. And then the UN withdrew from that base, and those people were slaughtered, simply handed over to their killers. That's a disgrace that it's very hard to recover from. And right now, next door in Congo, uh, you have the world's largest uh, UN peacekeeping mission in the field. It's the most expensive in the world. It costs more than a billion dollars a year, and it has done nothing to ameliorate the position of endangered people there. You have gone back and continue to do reporting on the situation. And in your latest article, you pointed out the strides that this country has made, almost unbelievably, in the face of people having to live in the same community with somebody who butchered their family. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the most extraordinary aspect of this story. I mean, in 1995, when I first visited Rwanda, about a year after the genocide, it was a country totally torn to pieces. And that doesn't just mean uh, that there were so many dead, but the infrastructure had been destroyed. Much of the population uh, responsible for associated with the killers had fled into exile and were threatening armed return. Uh, there were huge numbers of displaced people. The political structure was in tatters. There was no the, the ability to imagine it coming together, it really taxed even the most hopeful mind. And yet there were these leaders who said, well, but we have no choice. That's a luxury for you on the outside to speculate about whether we can make a country here. We have a country and we have to make it work. And 15 years later when I went back, it's not just well organized, but there, when I go out into the hills and I went and revisited some of the very same people, combination of killer living here and victims of that killer, survivors of the people, uh, families that he uh, wiped out, living you know, 100 yards down the road in very, very small uh, peasant communities uh, in the hills. Are they happy about the situation, about their coexistence? Not really. Are they, you know, joyfully or, or, or sort of mysteriously reconciled? No. And that had always bothered me. Some of the stories from Rwanda make it sound as if everybody's living in happy harmony. But no, but they are living together. And they are not threatening each other with death. They are accepting that it is their burden to have to find a way forward together. And that depends on a kind of political balancing act that's very difficult and that often depends on nobody being happy, right? Many or, people a thought, very, or a very strong executive. It does. A very strong executive, though, who denies either group a sort of sense of priority. In other words, survivors do not feel perfectly represented by this government. Although the government is described as a Tutsi government, they say, wait, we've been told to live with our killers, to put up with this, to get no compensation, to let them out of jail early, not even to see them properly punished, not to have proper trials. And in, def ex in return for what? Well, the answer is obvious, life. <laughs> and the killers have been uh, made to eat crow to a certain extent. They've been publicly ashamed but they're allowed to live, to prosper, and to start to be knit back into society. And in that way, they all become constituents of a government. It's a very smart politics, even if it's a very complex one and fragile. And you have decided to keep making this a story. You're going to write another, another book. I'm at work on another book about it. And in some ways, in terms of the things we've been talking about just now in this conversation, uh, in many ways, people have looked at Rwanda and at, 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 at huge crises abroad, and particularly in Africa, saying, well, you know, what can we do and how can we solve this? And if we don't solve it, it's obviously intractable and a mess. And what's really interesting to me is that that is, that's a very, uh, in some ways, egocentric view of the world, right? That we know what's best for people. That the argument should be about whether we do or don't intervene, rather than starting to say, well, what is it like when they come up with pro uh, solutions that don't fit all of our rubrics, that are sometimes uncomfortable seeming to us, but that tap into some idea of what their own culture is and what their own destiny is, and that for them, the stakes are absolute. We're monkeying around. People have two, three, four-year assignments. They go over. They look at things. They're Everybody in that country is going to live or die depending on whether this thing works. And that makes a really remarkable story right now. And it's a story that, in a tentative way, is one of greater promise. Education is now 
close to universal and much better than it ever was before. They have national health insurance in Rwanda for four dollars a year. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, and it may not be something that you or I would really be happy to be signed up for, but it means that lots of people are going to the doctor who weren't going to the doctor before. And that's a huge improvement if you talk to anybody there in medicine. They have uh, an economy that's been growing at seven, eight, nine percent a year. Now, like anything else, when you start at a very, very low number, it's easy to grow faster. But it's crucial because there's a government that's made the analysis that unless people basically have something to defend, have a country that works, it's vulnerable. As we close, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that your large works, your, your books, revolve around the theme of reminding people that humans are humans and that, you know, when we think about the Holocaust, for instance, as being in the past, it can never happen again. It can happen again. Yeah, I think none of us are protected against any of these things. And, um, and we should be careful to imagine that we are exempt. We aren't exempt. Uh, we live in this country in a fairly uh, complex and privileged and well-balanced place where I don't think, you know, people have said to me, well, could what happened in Rwanda happen here? And I would say, not tomorrow. But I wouldn't say that we're some other category of humanity that is immune to this. And so a lot of what I've really been struck by over time and what I guess my books are partly increasingly about is leadership, that it really, really matters who's in charge. That's what the story of Abu Ghraib tells us. That's a story about leadership. It's, it's been miscast as a story about followers. But by looking at those followers very, very closely in the Ballad of Abu Ghraib, you start to see much more inescapably how much it's really about who they're following and what leadership can do. And Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, years ago, long before he'd started making people reconcile in the way that he has and told killers and survivors to live together as intensely as he does, and started, he had started integrating into his army people from the enemy uh, that he'd been fighting. And now he's doing that at the highest level of generals. Uh, then, and I said to him, well, can you really take some guy who's been out slaughtering citizens on a tribal basis in a village and change his uniform and give him a couple of classes and make him a satisfactory soldier for you? And he said, this was 15 years ago almost, oh yes, I think that people can be made bad and they can be taught to be good. And it's an incredibly simple sounding thing, but when you really think about it, it's profound because it, it, it on the one hand is the most hopeful and on the other hand, the most sinister thing you can say about political power. And it tells you how much it matters who's wielding it. Well, thank you very much for bringing these stories to light, for continuing to bring them to light, and for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to author Philip Gorevich. I spoke with him at the Sun Valley Writers Conference. I'd like to thank the organizers of that conference for making their speakers available for interviews. If you'd like to learn more about the event or check out my other interviews from the conference over the years, please go to the Dialogue website at idahoptv.org. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Marsha Franklin. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.